Hello and welcome to Pots and Trowels and we're live tonight from Pots and Trowels HQ, our potting shed, and that's brought to you with the support of Cobra Garden and Darlac. Well, thank you for joining us. We thought tonight we'd do something a little bit different and we haven't done a live Pots and Trowels now for oh, ages and ages. With lockdown, Sean's not been able to get up and do things. So we're really pleased that he's here with us tonight. So Jill and Sean are working in the background. I don't know whether they can see you. Oh, there they are, yes. Just, they're not really doing anything. They're just monkeying around there. But Sean's twiddling all the knobs and the buttons and things so that hopefully you can see us at home. So we're going to be with you for a short while, not too long, just to let anybody know that if you've just joined us and you haven't seen Pots and Trowels before, we are every week on Facebook and also on YouTube. So we normally put the uh, videos, the gardening videos out on Facebook on a Thursday, usually at around six o'clock. And we cover all sorts of things. We answer questions, we'll be looking at fruit, flowers, vegetables, we'll go out and visit gardens. So we do something different each week. We try and keep it topical and we try and get as much practical content in there as possible. Um, and then occasionally we do things like this. So we, we thought we'd do a live tonight. Now, obviously here we are third week in October. It's absolutely pitch black out here. We're in North Yorkshire uh, and it's chucking it down with rain and we decided we don't want to be outside. So we've come into our makeshift potting shed. I've already had a comment from somebody saying it's quite a posh. It's not really, it's, it's, a, it's a conservatory, but this is where we do our little bits of broadcasting from. So I thought what we would do tonight is we'd answer some of your questions and quite a few of you have already sent questions in to us on Facebook. Uh, and then later on, we're gonna pop out into the garden that we recorded earlier on. So thank you for being with us. If you've got any comments, send them through, send, you know, say hello um, and we'll give you a shout out uh, later on. So we'll start with a few questions. Um, and these, as I say, have been sent in um, a while ago. This first one is from Glenda Biggs. Glenda's down in Northamptonshire. Uh, Glenda, oh, she starts by saying, sorry, but I can't join you tomorrow. But she's got a couple of questions. So hopefully, of course, you can catch up with this Glenda on Facebook and it will be on YouTube, as are all the videos that we've done over the last two and a half years. So there's a real big collection of videos on there. So please do have a look and subscribe. It's all free and lots of information. But Glenda says she can't join us, but she's got a couple of questions. First one is, can I move my tiger grass now and split it if possible? And if not, when can she move it? Well, this um, is a picture that we've got. Glenda sent us in a picture of her tiger grass. Well, I actually know this as zebra grass, Glenda. Um, but that's the thing with plants. They, they go under lots of different names. Its real name is Zebrinus. Uh, Miscanthus zebrinus, and that gives you a bit of a clue, I suppose, zebrinus zebra grass. And it's basically quite a tall, deciduous, ornamental grass that has got green leaves with little stripes on, hence the name tiger, zebra, whatever. Uh, it's one that dies down, so although it will stay there all the winter, what will happen as soon as the weather turns a bit cooler, we will start to get those lovely brown leaves on there. And then what we normally do with them is in about March time, we get the shears or the secateurs and we cut it completely down to ground level and then you'll get a mass of new growth and it will get back to four, five feet again by this time next year. So great plant for the mixed border and it looks a really healthy plant that you've got. You've obviously got somebody in your family that knows a bit about gardening, I'm sure. Um, when can you split it? Not now. The time to do it is March time, April. You want to wait until it's just starting to grow. So I would cut it down in early March, give it a few more weeks. Miscanthus like it fairly warm. So as soon as you've got the first signs of growth, you can either dig up the original clump and split it, or you can probably just get a spade and chop a piece of the existing clump out from the soil, replant it, pot it up, and away it will go. So nice, nice one to do, but you enjoy it for now, but you can't really do anything on it until next spring. And your second cutting is, can I take a, um, your second question rather, is can you take a cutting from a Fatsia japonica? Well, the answer is yes. Just put my clipboard down because it just so happens I've got a little bit of Fatsia japonica here. And this is a Fatsia japonica. Um, for those that don't know, it's a lovely evergreen plant, this is. 
and it's remarkably hardy. It always used to be grown as a house plant, but it will stand sub-zero temperatures uh, outside and it's evergreen, quite an architectural plant, got these big dark green hand-shaped leaves. And this is one that I've got in a pot that's got a variegated leaf on it. Um, and very often at this time of the year, they're just starting to flower. This one isn't flowering. So what I've done is taken a shoot off it. So if you want to have a go, and you can do this with the green form exactly the same, I've cut out the top three or four inches from uh, one of the stems that's growing in the garden. And I'm just gonna get my secateurs and I'm just gonna trim it. What I'm gonna do is very quickly show you how to prepare a cutting. I'm just gonna peel off some of these lower leaves and they snap off quite easily. So just snap those off. We don't want to leave too many leaves on because if we do, it will lose lots and lots of water So, and dry out, dehydrate. So I'm taking the majority of the leaves off like that. And then I'm just going to get my secateurs and I'm just going to trim it roughly where one of those leaves was. And if we, if we look closely there, I don't know whether Sean has got that. He probably has. We can see this is the stem. This is where the leaves were attached. And that is a bud there, a dormant little bud. So I'm gonna cut it just below and make a nice clean cut like that. And then what you need to do is to get yourself a plant pot, something about a four or five inch plant pot, nothing too big. And I've got a bit of multi-purpose compost in there. And then I'm just gonna make a hole with my finger and I'm gonna pop that into there. So it's literally a cutting that we've prepared. And I'm gonna push that into, there's about an inch and a half down there. We want it to be able to stand up on its own like that. And then that will be given a good drink of water. Now this needs ideally to be kept indoors at this time of the year, unless you've got a heated greenhouse, but I would put it on a windowsill where it's got reasonable light and the room isn't boiling hot, but it's not freezing cold. So something like this sort of conservatory would be ideal. And you could put a bag over it if you want, or just mist it occasionally. And what will happen is over the autumn and winter, roots will form. And then in the spring, you'll get some nice new growth from there. So it's something that you can be doing now. And it's what we would call a semi-ripe cutting at this time of the year. So yes, get cracking there with your Faxia japonica. Right, next question is from uh, Edie Edie. Hi Martin, when is the right time to prune my yellow rose? Again, we've got a photograph of your rose. Edith, great photograph, masses of flower, and I don't know when you took this. Um, you've said they're in the second flush of flowers, and you're not sure if it's a shrub rose or a floribonda, as they're not scented. Well, that isn't always the way to tell whether it's scented, because some floribundas are scented. Uh, not all shrub roses are heavily scented. But looking at it and looking at the habit of it, I think it's more of a floribunda. I don't think it's quite um, shrubby enough or tall enough to be a shrub rose. So it looks like a floribunda, which is a, a multi-headed rose at the end of the day. And quite a lot of shrub roses, of course, are, are, are multi-floral. So um, as for pruning it, well, I'm a great believer in doing a half prune in the autumn. But if yours is still full of flower like that, I would be tempted to probably leave it for another week or two. Let's get into November enjoy those flowers and you know if we get in wet and windy weather and maybe a few frost i don't know where you are they will stop flowering so as soon as that second flush of flowers goes off i would then cut it back by about half so it's deadheading it at the same time cutting it down to a bud reducing it by half and that will stop it blowing around in the winter and then come spring you can cut it a bit further down and you'll get a flush of new growth and even better flowers next year but it looks a lovely rose um, penny middleton uh, I said, hi, um, when do I prune a passion flower? Um, I've still got fruit and flowers on it, thank you. Well, very often passion flowers, and I think we've got a photograph of one to show people that don't know what a passion flower is. Um, it's a, a climbing plant. Um, it's, some of them aren't particularly hardy. The, the hardiest is one called Passiflora carulii, and that's the one that will stand growing outside in most parts of the UK. But in a very severe winter, they can be cut back by the frost. So again, a little bit like Edie Edie's rose, I would just let that continue to flower. You'll still get those beautiful flowers on. They often produce fruit that are about the size of a plum and they, they turn a sort of apricot orange color at this time of the year. They are edible, but I wouldn't say they're eatable. These aren't the ones that you'd buy as a passion fruit in a, in a supermarket or a green grow. So this is an ornamental form and they're usually hollow and got very little 
in the way of flesh in them. So enjoy them as an ornamental fruit on them. And I would then leave it over winter. I would never prune uh, a passion flower at this time of the year. Let it get through the winter. And then if it does get a bit of frost damage, you can just cut that out, tidy it up in spring. So usually the time to cut them back a little bit would be March time. Don't go mad because then it will just put on even more growth. So it's a tidy up pruning, cutting out any dead, damaged and diseased wood in the spring and encouraging some nice new growth. So good luck with that one. Uh, this is Willendale Hughes. Um, the leaves on my wisteria are turning yellow and dropping off. Uh, do you think there's a problem? It's a young plant, only planted this year. It's been given plenty of water. Thanks. Well, I think a couple of things. It is a young plant, so it takes them sometimes a while to get established. So, um, you know, it probably uh, what it will be doing now is making a good root system. And I'm sure next year, come spring, it will put on a lot more growth. Very often that first year, they don't make a lot of growth. So I wouldn't worry too much. I wouldn't water it now because obviously we're in autumn, we're getting plenty of rain, so the ground will be moist. But the fact the leaves are going yellow is simply because we are now, you know, coming to the end of October. Uh, it's a deciduous plant, it's going to drop its leaves and then next spring it will come back into leaves. So I wouldn't worry about it. I don't think there's anything wrong. I think it's just young, immature and still establishing. So keep your eye on it. Um, we've now got a question here from Sandra Masson. Um, how do you lift and store dahlias? <clears throat> well, some people don't. Some people leave them in the garden. But again, I think it depends whereabouts you live. Certainly where we are in North Yorkshire, we can occasionally get away with leaving the tubers in. But last year we had a very cold winter. The frost got down quite a way. So lots of dahlia tubers were killed. They are tender. They come from Mexico at the end of the day. So I, I still prefer to lift the tubers um, and store them over winter and then replant in the spring or start them off in pots and take some cuttings to raise some nice new healthy plants from them. The time to do it, and we've got a picture of a tuber, is to lift them as soon as the frost has blackened the foliage. So at the moment they're probably still growing and uh, you might even still have a few flowers on them but as soon as we get one or two quite harsh frosts the foliage will go black won't be enough to damage the tuber. And that's when you chop them down to a few inches from ground level, um, lift them out, uh, trim off any very spindly roots, but what you want are those big fat plump tubers. Um, and that's what you're gonna store. Put a label on it and then put them somewhere frost free. Uh, I normally put them under my greenhouse bench in some trays with a bit of compost around them. So they're nice and cool and they're keeping plump because they're not gonna dehydrate. Some people put them in a shed, but the thing is not to let them dry out too much, but you don't want them to be wet. And then just keep an eye on them and then you can replant those back in the garden sort of end of April next year, mid to late April, and then they'll start to grow by the time the frosts have gone. Or as I mentioned, you could start them off in some pots, in some warmth and light, get some new shoots off them, take them as cuttings. But if you live in a cut, an area where you do get quite a lot of frost in the winter, I would certainly dig them up within, certainly by the end of November, you want them out the ground. And then we've got a question, similar sort of answer really. This is from Anne Watts. Um, what do I do with canna plants over winter? Well, canna's lovely plants. They have more of a rhizome type root rather than a tuber. Uh, long, quite decorative leaves can be green or purple or stripy, and then flower spikes out the top in a range of colours, yellow, oranges and reds. Again, these aren't frost hardy, so you would treat them very, very similar to a dahlia. So again, wait until we've had a little bit of frost, then you could lift that clump up, trim it down, and I normally just stand them in some biggish pots with the root ball, about the size of a bucket, um, and then they will be absolutely fine. Um, keep them frost free and then plant them back in the garden again next springtime. So what we're going to do is have a look at some flowers from the garden, but we've just had um, a few comments passed by the team and they're all there saying hello. Are you all right there? Having a nice time. So these people are saying hello. We've got D Godden. Hi D. Um, e D E D says it's raining in Edinburgh. Well, it is here as well. So yeah, dark as well, isn't it? Uh, Lynn Edmonds, Vi Fish, Robert Fish all say hello. So hi to everybody. That's strange. Our name's Fish, isn't it? What a coincidence that is. <laughs> Crikey. Um, and um, please share this stream. So yes, 
let everybody know we're on here tonight so we can get more people watching. So if you're on Facebook or tell your friends, give them a text now, tell them to join us on Pots and Trowels Live. So what I thought we'd do now is I've been a little wander around the garden earlier today um, and just picked a few things because, you know, it's the end of October almost, isn't it? It's Halloween at the weekend, but there's still colour in the garden. And I thought rather than pick foliage, which I normally do, I would pick a few of the late autumn flowers that are looking absolutely lovely at the moment. So here I've got this one, and these are in no particular order. Um, this is a lovely flowering plant, which used to be called Schizostylus. It's now called Hesperantha. Um, and it is absolutely lovely. It looks a little bit and grows like a gladioli. So when the flower spikes are there, you've got these tall spikes, strap-like leaves, doesn't start to flower really until um, probably September, mid, early to mid-September. The normal form is a darker colour, sort of a red colour, but you can get salmon pinks. This one is a, a lovely pale pink called Pink Princess, Hesperantha Pink Princess. But it flowers and flowers and flowers right the way through the autumn when lots of things have finished. Um, it's hardy, you know, we grow it in the garden here in North Yorkshire. It's absolutely fine. It, we've often had it in flower uh, up to December. If we've had a mild autumn, it goes up to December. So it's one that's really worth growing. Uh, plant it in a border just to give some late summer colour. Works well with grasses and other foliage plants around it. And then we've got things um, like that are still flowering, like the lovely hardy fuchsias. These are the ones that we can plant in the garden. And there's, there's loads and loads of different types. Some have got delicate little white flowers, some are pink flowers. This is more your traditional type, you know, the larger flowering fuchsia. But these are totally hardy. We plant them in the garden and they will flower again until we start to get some really cold, frosty weather. So hopefully we'll get another week or two out of them yet. And then they will just go dormant and burst into growth again in the spring. You can cut them down if they're frosted a bit, but the roots will always survive. Now this one is something a little bit different. These spikes here, if I can just get one out, um, I don't know if Sean can see these, but this is, believe it or not, a salvia. Now, not the sort of bedding plant salvia that we plant. This is one of the shrubby salvias. This one comes from Brazil. And th there are hundreds and hundreds of amazing salvias. This one would grow to about four or five feet tall. It's a shrub, so it's a woody plant, but it isn't hardy. So this one I grow in a large pot um, and it's outside still at the moment, but as soon as we get really frosty weather, it will stand a degree or two of frost, but as soon as it gets very frosty, I, I bring it either into this little garden conservatory or I'll put it into the greenhouse. But the flowers are amazing, this orangey red flower on these spikes. But the stems, I just wish you could feel this because these stems are so velvety and they're absolutely wonderful. And it's been in flower for about a month. And if I take it indoors, it will flower till Christmas. And then what I do is cut it down in the spring and up it grows again. So that one is called Salvia Conferti Flora. Um, and it is a lovely, lovely, unusual plant, but it does need some frost protection. We've got just here a plant that is in a pot as well, but this one can stay outside. This is called Tulbagia. Its common name is Society Garlic because it smells like garlic and you can actually use the leaves as a, as a garlic substitute. The reason it's called Society Garlic is because very often if you eat a garlic bulb, you can taste it on your breath or smell it on people's breath the following day. But this one apparently doesn't leave an aftertaste. It's quite a strong smell. I can smell it now. Um, but it's grown also as an ornamental plant for these amazing flowers. This is grown in a pot. Imagine um, chives. If you know what chives look like, those sort of spiky leaves with the flowers, that's what it looks like. And this has been in flower in our garden in two containers since late May. And here we are now, October. So it's May, June, July, August, September. Five months. Is that right? Seemed longer than that. And it's still flowering its head off, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, and then all we do when it's finished flowering, deadhead it in the spring, Jill's in charge of it. She chops it pretty much to ground level. She's pretty brutal when she's pruning, but it works. And we just get this flush of flowers and it is amazing. So that one is called Tulbagia. It's a plant that comes from South Africa, but again is, is pretty hardy. Another South African plant, this one is a bulbous plant. This one is Nareen. 
And the veins are normally a, a much brighter pink than this, but this is a, a very pale pink one. And these are bulbs. And again, um, these like somewhere sheltered, but they are hardy. Plant these against the south facing wall and don't plant them like you would any other sort of spring flowering bulbs. These are obviously autumn flowering, but normally we plant bulbs two or three times their depth. So if you're putting your daffodils in now or your alliums, or you're getting ready to plant the tulips, they're gonna be two to three times the depth. This one, do not do that. I know sometimes people say plant it like any other bulb, but that is totally wrong. This one has to be planted. So the tip of the bulb is visible and sticking out of the soil. So it's really three quarters of the bulb in the soil, one third of the bulb sticking out. Plant them in a sunny position that's well drained. Doesn't matter if they bake dry and suffer with drought in the summer, that's what they like. They want to think they're back in South Africa. Um, and once they've established, you'll get masses of flowers from the end of September until November. And the tighter the bulbs get after a few years, the better they will flower. So worth growing nareens. Time to buy and plant the bulbs is usually spring. That's when you'll get them. So look out for those next year. Plant them in spring, enjoy the flowers in the autumn. And just finally, before we've got one or two more questions, I love grasses. It's, they're growing on me. It's something that I was never a big fan of, ornamental grasses. But the more I see them, the more I love them. Because I just think at this time of the year, they really come into their own because they've started to flower. And they come in all different shapes and sizes, dwarf ones, tall ones, small flowers, large flowers. But I just love these frondy flowers on these. And, you know, mixed in with some of these late summer autumn flowering plants in the border, they look absolutely fantastic. This one is a Calamagrostis. This is one um, that dies down in the winter. You chop it down in the spring and then you will get lovely growth and just these flowers. And through the winter, of course, they're there. They just breeze around with a little bit of wind and just add some movement and texture to the garden. So just a few things that are looking good at this time of the year. So back to the questions. Um, oh, that was that for later. Right, just keep giving me all these questions. Share the stream. That's, I can't read that one, it's in code. But we've got a couple more questions. Um, Emilio uh, Lantosca has been in touch and said, how do I prevent my camellia from getting black spots on the leaves? Well, without seeing it, Emilio, it's quite difficult to know what they are. Sometimes it's not a disease with camellias. It can sometimes be the growing conditions. If the ground is very wet, for example, or sometimes if they suffer a little bit from drought, that can cause black marks or, or even sun scorch can cause dark brown black marks on the foliage. So it might be the growing conditions that are causing the problem. So if that is the case, um, then just, you know, try and correct the conditions. If it's somewhere very dry, make sure it has more water, especially in the summer and early autumn when the flower buds are forming. Um, the other thing it can be, sometimes they can get a fungal leaf spot. Um, so if you think it is a fungus on there, then you could use one of the rose fungicides early on in the season. It's too late really now, but through the summer, maybe give it a rose fungicide spray, the sort of thing you would use for black spot. Or the other thing, it can be sometimes not a spot, but sometimes the leaves get a black film on top of them. And we call that sooty mold. And that's often if they've got scale insect or aphids on there that are sucking the sap out of them. They exude a, a sticky honeydew that lands on the leaf and then the fungus, the sooty mold grows on it. And if that's the case, um, then you've got to control the pest by using an organic insecticide, one of the fatty acids, and that will then wash off, as, as there's no insect there, the sooty mold will wash off. So um, I'm not sure which one it is, but hopefully you'll be able to sort it out. And uh, our final question in this section, because I'm ready for a lie down then, uh, is from um, Mary Darcy. Mary has an Acer that isn't doing very well. It's been in a largish pot for a couple of years now, but parts of the leaves are going brown and dry. I water it and it's in a relatively wind-free position. What am I doing wrong? Well, um, I suspect it is probably weather 
related or growing conditions. Aces are naturally woodland plants, so they like a bit of dapple shade. You, having said that, you occasionally see one in full sun and it does amazingly well, but generally speaking, they benefit from a little bit of dapple shade. They don't like wind, so if you suffer from wind, then you need to make sure you give it a little bit of protection. Behave yourself, you two. If where you live, you suffer from wind in the garden. Um, um, so protect it from late frosts, but very often at this time of the year, um, when you get in those browning of the leaves, partly it's because we're going into autumn, but it can be that the weather that we've had in late summer, early autumn can have caused the problem. And, you know, I don't know where you are, Mary, but certainly here in North Yorkshire, we had a very dry August, September, um, and, you know, plants were wilting in the garden. The ground was very, very dry. So as a result, the plants didn't do well. Now, even in a pot, they dry out very quickly. The roots get very warm. So I think it's more weather related. So the leaves are going to fall off soon. Um, when it comes into leaf in the spring, give it some extra feed, give it a slow release fertilizer mixed in with the compost to give it a bit of a boost and then make sure you keep it moist all the way through. Never, never let it dry out and hopefully you'll get that lovely flush of foliage. But I, I really wouldn't worry about it for now. So that's all sort of the ornamental questions that we've answered for now. Um, we're going to do some fruit and veg questions that we've been sent in. Uh, in a short while. Um, but earlier on today, um, Sean and I popped down to the veg plot just to have a quick look round, just to see what's happening there. So this is what's looking good in the garden at the moment. <coughs> Well, here we are, we're in autumn now, so the veg plot's been more or less emptied of all the summer crops, but we've got the winter crops to look forward to. And the leeks are doing particularly well. They're putting on some good growth and we're getting some nice big leeks there. The brassicas, still got the winter ones. We've got some winter cabbages. We've got all the lovely kales. That, again, we can harvest those right the way through until next March, April time. This was a potato bed. We had a good crop of potatoes. They've all been lifted now and they're in, uh, in storage somewhere dark and cool. That's the main thing with potatoes and to check them now and again to make sure there's no rot. So if you haven't got your potatoes up yet, make sure you get them out soon. Um, we've still got beetroot. Beetroot has done phenomenally well this year. Um, the soil here in Dennis's plot where we're growing the veg is wonderful. And we just look at these, these, this is a, a, not a round one, this is a long one. Look at this one here. It's like a monster, but they taste absolutely delicious, these are. And a little tip, of course, when you are harvesting your beetroot is always twist the tops off like that. Don't cut them off, otherwise they bleed and that firm root will go very soft quickly because all the, the sap will leak out. So just twist them off like that. And what we'll be doing in the next few weeks, um, we've had a little bit of ground frost, but nothing too much at the moment. But if we get a severe winter, beetroot doesn't always survive, it can rot. So what we'll probably do is we get out of October into November, Jill and I will come down one day, we'll lift these, screw the tops off, and then I've got some old plastic crates and I've got some old compost, old potting compost. You could use damp sand. I put a layer of the damp compost in, then we'll put the beetroot on, a layer of sand and beetroot, and then we'll store them somewhere really, really cool, but frost free. And they will stay in good condition right the way through until uh, spring. So it's a good way to preserve your beetroot. Of course, we'll also be pickling some of them as well. And then we've got the parsnips just here. We haven't actually started lifting them yet because we've, we've had so much veg that we've been getting out the garden. And lots of people don't like to lift their parsnips until they've had a bit of frost. The tops are just starting to go back on these now. And we've had a, say, a couple of frosts, but nothing much. The idea is the frost makes them that little bit sweeter, but I'm gonna just lift a couple because I'm interested to know what we've got underneath here. So this could be a disaster. Um, so we'll see. I'm using a fork because I don't want to break the roots. So I'm, I'm hoping, uh, not too bad. Bit forked, that one. They're not too bad. And, you know, they uh, don't matter if there's a bit of a fork on it. So when you say fork, you don't mean fork as in what you just put in the ground? You no. Split. This is a good example. Well done, Sean. I knew you are here for a reason. So this one, look at that, that is a really good parsnip there. Nice, long, tapered root, no splits in it. Whereas this one is forked. So what will have happened at some point when this was growing, the growing tip will have been damaged 
and instead of producing one long tapering root like this one we've got multi roots there and, and that can happen sometimes when people sow their um, parsnips or their carrots in little modules and transplant them out it breaks the root so that's why with beetroot parsnips and carrots I always sow directly into the soil but this has probably just hit a little stone or something that's damaged the root but perfectly edible and they again will stay in the soil right the way through until April next year. The compost heap's been busy what I did last weekend was emptied it and this is the compost that we've made through the summer so we can see that this is really lovely compost. This is all the waste that went in early part of the summer. There's leaves, there's grass cuttings, there's chopped hedge cuttings, weeds and vegetable waste out of the garden. And this is an amazing compost. So I've emptied this out and we'll use this to prepare the beds through the winter ready for planting and sowing next spring. And the compost bin here, which we've had a look at before, you've seen it before. Somebody asked me how I made this one. This was actually made as a prototype by somebody for me. It's insulated, so it's plastic panels and then inside it's got some insulation um, to give it sort of a hot box effect. And what we did, Jill and I got all the cut flowers out, all the beans, and it was shredded. So in here, and this is really warm, I wish you could feel the heat. That is really, really warm. Uh, it's got all the sweet corn, all the bean stems, all the cut flowers on the front, grass cuttings, leaves, have all been shredded and put into here. Um, and it's already, in just a week, has started to rot down and generate quite a lot of heat. You can probably see some of the steam coming off that. That is really, really hot. To the point where I can't hold it for too long. It so smells great. It does, doesn't it? Already, it smells like you're cooking something. When we filled it at the weekend, it was pretty much to the top, so it's settled by half its volume uh, in the last week. So what I'm going to do this week, and I've got some more leaves, more grass cutting, some more veg waste waiting in bags at the back there. So I'm going to top this up and keep it full. So over winter that will rot down, and next spring we'll have another full compost bin there so plenty still to do in the garden lots of clearing and a great time to start a compost bin well there we go even though we're end of October there's still quite a bit that we can be harvesting from the veg garden through the winter and fortunately with all that beetroot and those parsnips Jill makes a mean beetroot and chocolate cake that is delicious and a wonderful parsnip cake. So it will be put to good use and I'm sure Sean will be trying it. Now, if you want to know how to make those and how to turn some of your wonderful gardening produce into beautiful tasty dishes, I'm going to do an advert now because, you know, all programmes have an advert in the middle. So this is the advert. Jill and I have had a reprint of our book, which is Gardening on the Menu. Uh, we wrote it a couple of years ago and had a reprint and it's all photographed from our garden. I talk about a range of 25 different fruit and vegetables and then Jill follows on with her delicious recipes. Some savoury, lots of sweet ones, lots of quick cook tips in there, lots of them old family recipes from Jill's mum and my mum and family and friends. So if you are interested in growing and putting your good produce to good use then please please feel free to have a look at this it's called gardening on the menu you won't get it in gardening shops but you can get it from our website uh, which is an easy one to remember it's called martinfish.com if you go on the website it's there you can buy it online it's 12.95 plus pmp um, for 300 pages of growing and recipes looks like a good christmas present it does look like a good christmas <laughs> Oh no, that's sport the surprise for you now, Sean. So yeah, and we'll even sign it for you. If you do want to buy one, just let us know and we will sign it with any dedication that you want. So it's called Pots and Trials. So have a look for that. Right, end of advert now. Put that back there. It's not called Pots and Trials. No, it's not. It's called <laughs> Gardening on the Menu. Gardening on the Menu. I do apologise. This is. And we've got to apologise. We're having a few broadband problems tonight. It's a bit slower than normal. So I think we've got a, a few juddery pictures. So please do stay with us uh, and share it to your friends. If you share it live on Facebook now to your friends, we'll get more people joining us. But if you are missing any little bits, as I say, persevere. But what Sean will be doing tomorrow, he will upload all of this because he's recording it on the video cameras uh, as high definition. So that will go on YouTube and he'll also put it back 
on Facebook so you can watch again if your question's been answered you can watch it nice and clear without any juddering or Norman Collier microphone bits like that. So I thought we'd answer a few veggie questions now we've just had a stroll into the vegetable plot um, and first one is from Jane Edwards. Jane uh, says my outdoor tomato plants got blight this year and she'd like to know if she can reuse the compost in the vegetable patch next year. Well in theory, I think the textbooks would probably say no. Um, but I think as long as you don't use it to grow potatoes or uh, tomatoes, which are all the same family, they both get blight, I think you'll be fine. And if you use it on early crops as well, so very often I save the compost that I've grown potatoes in pots in my tomato compost, and I use it to use in pots to grow early salads that I'm sowing in March and April because they don't need a lot of nutrition, so it's ideal for them and it's recycling the compost. Uh, or, you know, if you've got runner beans and broad beans that you want to start off in spring in pots and trays, then that second-hand compost, as it were, that you've recycled can be used for that. So I think as long as you're careful with it, you should be absolutely fine. Um, Sheila Anderson. Uh, Sheila lives in the far northeast of Scotland, and she's got a three by two meter raised bed in which she would like to grow some asparagus. And uh, she's in the north of Scotland, as I've said, and she wants to know, do you think it's worth a go? And if yes, which variety to plant and how to prepare the bed? Well, I, I don't really know whether it will grow that far north. I, I suspect it will. I don't know how cold it gets in the winter, but I think the secret with asparagus is it needs to be in very well-drained soil. So if you've got wet, sticky clay, then I wouldn't consider it. But I think the fact that you've got raised beds means you can improve that soil. The drainage will be good. So work in plenty of organic matter, but it also needs to drain freely to do it. Um, so I would have a go if I were you. The time to plant is normally sort of March, April time, and you buy them as what we call asparagus crowns. And I think you can probably see them there being planted on the screen. Um, and they are these spidery roots that you buy and you prepare the ground well, you dig a trench, make a bit of a V in the centre and then let the roots straddle it and plant it so the tips of the crowns are a couple of inches below ground level. Do that then, the first year you won't get anything, it takes a couple of years. There's a really good paragraph in the book, Guardian on the Menu, on growing asparagus uh, and also how to cook it. Um, so it's going to take a couple of years to establish and, and then behave yourself you two um, and, and then it will grow and, and I think you'll be okay. So it's worth a go uh, and you, you'll get quite a few plants because you plant them about a foot apart so you'll get quite a few in your raised bed. As for varieties, one of the hardiest is one called, um, I don't know how you pronounce this, it's, it's spelled G-U-E-P-H, Gueff, Gueff? Millennium. So GF Millennium. Um, we will put some of the names, if you like, on Facebook. Uh, but the other really good, reliable ones is one called Backlim and one called uh, Ginlim. Uh, and they are hybrids and they're the ones that I grow and they do very well. So yeah, I, I would certainly give it a go. I know there is somebody growing asparagus commercially um, in sort of Perthshire, uh, going up sort of towards Dundee. And it, and it grows really well there. Um, and Childs, how do I get my runner beans to go brown so I can save the seed for next year? So I'm assuming you've still got the pods on. They are a bit slow this year, aren't they? I, we've had the same problem. If you want to save some seed off runner beans, then you can do, you let some of the pods mature and instead of green, you want them to go really brown and dry and then you can take the seed out. So all you can do really is to leave them on the plant or if they're just starting to turn from green and the pods are fully formed in there, then pick them off and put them on a, a sheet of newspaper in a tray somewhere cool uh, and dry and let them dry off naturally and then you can peel the pods open and get the seeds. And what I do with them when I've gathered my own, I put them in a paper bag because paper bags don't sweat like polythene and then they'll be nice and dry and just keep them cool over the winter and then you can sow them next year. So I think it's just probably because we've got a late season this year, they haven't ripened as quickly as they would normally. Uh, Catherine Mays um, has harvested sweet peppers and two of the plants seem to be thriving, throwing out new shoots. If I keep these indoors and frost free, what would the outcome for next year growing season be? Well, they are technically perennials. There's shrubby plants, are peppers and chili peppers and the sweet peppers. 
Um, so they will live from year to year. And I know some people that do it, but you do need to have warmth and plenty of light um, because you know, our light levels are normally very low in the winter. So we've got to put them in a really bright windowsill or um, a heated greenhouse. They need to be kept at about minimum of 10 degrees, ideally over winter in a bright position, keep them watered, but not too wet. Um, and if they make longish growth, pinch them out. And yes, you can overwinter them. And it basically will give you a head start for next year. Um, you'll get flowers and fruit much earlier because the plants are established, but you must keep them you know, warm and moist in a light position over the winter to be able to do that. A um, Couple of questions now on citrus. First one is from Bob Calvert. And he says, can you tell me if citrus need a special compost to grow? Um, well, they don't need a special compost, but they need a good compost because they're going to live in pots for a number of years. I mean, I've got a few in here. I've got oranges and there's a, a lime that I've got just here. I don't know whether you can see that. Can we see that, Sean? We can see that. Um, and that one is um, been in this pot for probably five or six years. And we've got blossom on it at the moment. And we've also got limes that are forming on it. Um, and I grow all my citrus in a mixture 50-50 of multi-purpose compost and Johnny is number two. Um, and I mix that 50-50. I add a bit of extra grit to it as well, just to keep it nice and open. And they seem to do really well in that. The secret is in the summer, never let them dry out. I also supplement them with some extra liquid feeds, high potash tomato feed when they're flowering. Even at this time of the year, I'll keep them watered and, and fed perhaps once every two or three weeks just to keep the flowers and the fruits developing. Um, and so as long as you keep them watered and fed, they'll grow really well. But that 50-50 seems to work well. And another one on citrus, this is from Kevin Vince. Kevin um, has grown a lemon plant from Pip. So well done, Kevin. It's always fun to put orange pips in and lemon pips in, isn't it? Isn't it? And we've got your photograph on the screen. Um, I think your question is basically saying it's still only a small plant. It doesn't seem to be growing. It's a bit stunted. Um, and how to get it growing. Well, looking at the, the picture, it's quite a small plant. So it looks quite a nice, healthy plant, having said that, but it's in a huge pot. It's in a 12 inch pot. And it's all about the proportion. If you put a small plant in a big pot, it doesn't always make the roots there. It can get too wet. So I think it's over potted. In other words, the pot is too big for it. You know, this lime you're looking at here, the pot is, is only in a 12 inch pot it's not, it's deeper than yours, but it's only a 12 inch diameter. So I think what you need to do is carefully get a trowel and take that pot, uh, that little plant out of there and repot it in some fresh compost, buy some new compost and pot it into something no bigger um, than the one I probably did for the cutting. So I don't know where I've put it. Nothing bigger than that. About a four inch pot is more than big enough for it. Um, and then just keep it moist, keep it on a light, bright, sunny windowsill where there's a bit of warmth and I'm sure it will grow with a bit of fresh compost and then come the spring feed it and away it will go. I'm sure it will be fine. Right, a bit of a pest problem here now from Ray Walter. Hi Martin, I have a Bramley apple tree about 25 years old and it's covered in woolly aphids. So thick it looks like a frost covering. How can I get rid of them? Uh, in winter I washed it twice with a winter wash and I've tried hosing them off to no avail. Is there anything I can do to get rid of them? The tree is covered in nodules and I fear it's past its best. Well, woolly aphid, um, and Sean's gonna put your picture up there, is a sap sucking insect. It's a type of aphid, sucks the sap out, but it, it's mainly a problem on trees. And it's got this waxy furry coat on it that's a natural protection. Um, the problem is it overwinters by getting into all the nooks and crannies in the bark, so it's quite, uh, difficult to control and get to. We can get winter washers that are sort of fatty acids and, and spray them. And if you've got any sort of cracks in the bark, make sure you direct it into there so it gets to them. But they're, they're not the best way to control them. Um, what you could do is when it's active, um, sort of later, well, you could, if it's active on the tree now, have a go now, use one of the insecticides. But if you don't want to use anything chemical, use one of the natural ones like natural pyrethrum or the fatty acids are usually made from plant extracts. And they're quite good because they, the fatty acids burn through that waxy coating that gives it protection and gets to the aphid and will kill it. So you could do that. There are things called plant invigorators as well 
that burn through that waxy coating and also almost feed the plant as well to encourage growth. I think you've got to do it little and often, you know, blast them off at this time of the year and then treat them with something. If you don't mind using a chemical, then you can get some stronger synthetic insecticides that will actually get through that coating and destroy them as well. But if you don't, it will really weaken the tree because you get these nodules, you get cankers, um, and it, it just, it's sucking the life out of the tree at the end of the day. Colin Brown, uh, any advice on digging up raspberries that have just finished fruiting? So there, but the autumn fruiting one's delicious. My sister would like them, so should I cut them back now? Well, wait until they finish fruiting, and I would wait until the leaves have fallen off. So give them another month, uh, Caroline, before you, did I say Caroline or Colin? Before, I do apologize because I've got a friend called Colin Brown, so uh, it's Caroline Brown this is. We'll edit that bit out, don't worry, nobody's, nobody's heard that. Um, so yes, Caroline, wait until the leaves have fallen off. So probably at the end of November, you could then lift some of those, what we call raspberry canes, those single stems, and I would cut them down to about a foot, not to ground level at this stage. Let your sister plant them in the garden straight away um, at the same depth that they've been growing, and then next, February, at the end of February, cut them down to ground level. You'll get growth through the summer and it's on that growth that your sister will get a delicious crop of autumn raspberries next autumn. Oh yeah, okay. Your writing's terrible, Sean. <laughs> you, I need an auto cue. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca O'Sullivan, my sprouts are absolutely covered in white fly and any suggestions how to stop them? Um, She's been spraying with uh, diluted soap, but they are still prolific. Well, it, there is a white fly, brassica white fly, that you get on cabbages, Brussels, kale. It, it's related to the white fly we get on tomatoes and greenhouse plants. But this is a really tough, hardy one that... Will you two behave yourself? I'm going to have to send you there's, out. There's a really big delay, and we just saw me putting the... Oh, did you? Okay, right. It's a delay. It's about 30 seconds. A 30 second delay, okay. Um, so yes, it, it's, it's a real problem is this brassica white fly um, and it's, it's immune to lots of chemicals anyway. Um, I think, like I mentioned for Ray with the woolly aphid, use some of the natural insecticides, the fatty acids and the plant extracts because they seem, I think, to work better than any of the synthetic ones um, and they're not as harmful to beneficial insects and certainly at this time of the year there aren't many of the beneficials around at the moment uh, and there's no harvest period so you can literally spray them and still eat them so I would do that at the end of the day they don't do a great deal of damage it's more a nuisance and the problem is if you're picking that curly kale there's always the little white flies in it but you know by the time you've boiled it and eaten it it's just a bit of extra protein so that's great um, the message from Sean was tell people what we do. What do we do on Pots and Trowels? Well, we do a video every week, usually on a Thursday, we put it on Facebook, something topical in the garden. We can be pruning, it can be lawn maintenance, house plants, you name it, we will cover it on Pots and Trowels. And we go out on a Thursday and then it also is uploaded onto YouTube. So we've got a whole back catalogue. We've been doing this every week without a break uh, for the last two and a half years at least and through the first lockdown last year we're doing it twice a week so there's there's a couple of hundred videos on there now of gardening subjects and garden visits that we've been to over the last two and a half years so please please spread the word and subscribe it's all for free and if you've got any ideas send them in to us we're always looking for new things to cover uh, while we're filming. Uh, Dee Godden uh, sent a question in this evening. When should I prune my fig tree? It's getting tall and I can't reach the fruit. Any suggestions with what to train it with, please? Uh, and that's from in Devon. Well, they'll grow really well in Devon. We grow one in North Yorkshire. The tro trouble is our summers aren't always long enough for the fruits to ripen and the little embryo figs often get frosted in the winter. But hopefully in Devon, your climate is a little milder. Um, the time to prune it is not now, it is in spring. So uh, I would do it sort of March time when you know, hopefully you're not going to get too much in the way of heavy frost, although they are remarkably tough. Um, and then it will put out new growth. And if you're going to try and train it, I would, if you can, try and train it back towards a wall. They're much easier to look after if you can sort of keep them flat to a wall than if it's a huge, great big shrub. Uh, Violetta Fish, we're moving house soon. Uh, how can we transport our grapevine, which is very large? 
Well, vi, uh, grapevines move very well. You can sometimes buy them in garden centres which were grown on a vineyard and people then they dig these big gnarled trunks up like that, put them in pots and sell them to people to plant in their garden. So they will transport. The thing to do is as soon as the leaves fall off is to cut it quite hard back. So you still want the main trunk and a few side branches, but you can cut all of it off. You won't be able to transport the whole growth. So you're going to cut it back almost to a stump dig it up with as much root on it as you possibly can, and then get a big pot, you know, a big bucket size pot, something like that, pop that in there, put a bit of fresh compost around it, and it will be fine left like that through the winter. As long as you plant it by spring into its new position or put it into, you know, keep it in the pot and keep it watered and fed, it will sprout and it will make lots of new growth. And then within a couple of years, it will be back to its normal self. So good luck with that. Um, Joy Elizabeth has got a question. Uh, when should I cut back agapanthus? Well, two types of agapanthus, Joy. Some stay evergreen and some naturally die back. The leaves will go yellow and die back. So if it's the, um, the latter, the deciduous one, it will die back within the next month and, and just go back to ground level. Um, but you don't normally cut the evergreen ones back at this time of year. So if it keeps the majority of its leaves, leave it until spring and then it's a case of going off and cutting out some of the bad leaves and tidying it up then but certainly don't do it now because those leaves are giving it a little bit of protection got to say hello to some people that are watching tonight on facebook uh Anne childs penny middleton and patrick lennon so hello say hello team hi oh just hi, right. <laughs> there you go Jolly good. Right, Mark Roberts, um, when do I prune my peony and how short, please? Well, um, oh, do we know what sort of peony Mark's got? Is it a tree peony or is this a herbaceous peony? If it's a herbaceous peony, the ones that go to two, three feet tall um, and produce this flush of new growth in the spring and then die back down, that's what we call a herbaceous peony. Um, that one will naturally start to die back any time now. And as soon as all the foliage has gone, yellow and the plant looks like it's naturally dying back you can cut it back if it's a tree peony and these can range from three feet to sort of eight feet depending on the type of them uh, then you would normally do any pruning on those in in early spring bit of thinning out tidying up you don't prune them too much they don't like to be cut back too much to be fair uh, but i certainly wouldn't be doing it at this time of the year unless it's any dead wood and you could cut that out of it um, Susan Burke um, has a clematis in a pot and she'd like to know um, if it should be put in the greenhouse for the winter. Um, as long as it's a hardy clematis, and th th I'm imagining it is that you've got, they will be absolutely fine outside. Um, all I would suggest is that, and this is for anything growing in a pot outside, if we get, you know, in January or February we get minus 10, then it's always worth just wrapping some bubble polythene or some hessian sacking around the pot itself just to protect the roots but the the actual stems are totally hardy so but for now it's absolutely fine i would leave it outside they grow well in pots um any more questions no, no more questions no. from anybody no. you sure in that case i think we're almost there aren't we are we ready for a glass of wine team and something to eat <laughs> yeah um we've got one this is from louise cracknell any top tips for what we can do in the garden now. Well, um, top tips, I suppose, is we're starting to start the, the tidy up process for winter. I don't like the term, let's put the garden to bed because that makes it sound like it's finished for the year. And there's so much interest in the garden through late autumn and through the winter, especially with stem colors and evergreen foliage and winter flowering plants and that type of thing. Um, so, but it's a tidy up. So soft perennials that are collapsing, you can tidy up anything structural with lovely seed heads, leave them on there. Um, I like to do a little bit of um, tidying up of things like buddleias, for example. Um, if they you know, are really getting too big, I would shorten them a little bit just to stop them blowing around in the wind. Uh, roses, as we mentioned earlier, when they finished, usually by November, prune them back a little bit, again, to stop them uh, rocking around. So it's just that little bit of gentle tidying up. And then, of course, the leaves are going to be falling off any time now. So, uh, and they've already started. Um, 
you don't have to pick them up every day, but I think if they're on a lawn, it's quite important that you collect them on a fairly regular basis because they will smother the lawn and the lawn will go yellow because of lack of light and the worms will come up and you'll have worm casts and it weakens the lawn. So certainly get them off the lawn, put them in the compost heap. If you use your lawn mower to collect them and it cuts the bits of grass, the tufty bits of grass at the same time, the grass and the leaf mixture rots down really well in the compost heap. As you saw, you know, when we went to look at the compost heap earlier, after just a week, it was already starting to break down and rot down and build up lots of heat. So put all those leaves to really good use. And of course, there's still time to plant lots of bulbs. You know, you need to get your daffodils in if you haven't got them in and your crocus and your alliums and your hyacinths. They should really be in by the end of October at the latest but we're only just coming into the tulip bulb planting season. We wait until the soil has cooled right down. So mid-November to mid-December, get in your tulips, plant them three times their depth and they'll be wonderful. Or put them in some pots with a few trailing ivies over so you'll get a wonderful display. And what I always say to people any time of the year, and this is more than a few tips, isn't it really? Visit other gardens because a great way to get ideas and inspiration for your garden, apart from watching pots and trowels every week, is to visit gardens because you get so many ideas from other gardens. I, we're in North Yorkshire. I was at Harlow Car, the RHS garden earlier this week, and it was just a riot of colour. Late perennials, autumn leaves, evergreen foliage, grasses. And it's a great way to look at plants in other gardens and think, oh, that is wonderful I'm going to try that in my garden and that will happen right the way through the winter because gardens change and evolve so if you get a fine day I would say to everybody go and visit a garden and just make a note of some of the plants that are looking good so that you can put them on the list and add them to your garden when you do a bit of replanting so I think that's it isn't it from us um, we're about finished we've been with you for nearly an hour so thank you thank you thank you for watching us tonight and being with us for our live stream. Um, please share it, as I say, the only way we're gonna get more people watching uh, is to share it and you know, then we can spread the tips and guardian advice to as many people as possible. And as I mentioned earlier, Sean will have this tomorrow uploaded um, as the recorded version without any glips or anything like that. Um, can you make me look taller on the new version and probably make my hair not look so grey? Um, that will be on Facebook tomorrow, but it will also be on YouTube, so you can look at it anytime. So um, we'll be back next week. I don't know what we're going to be doing. I think we might be doing a bit of lawn care, a bit of autumn lawn care, making sure your lawn's in good condition for the winter and just dealing with moss and thatch and things like that in the, in the garden. But as I said earlier, if you've got any ideas for things that you would like us to cover, um, during the coming months and winter on pots and trials just send us a message on facebook and we will do our best to try and fit it into one of our programs so thank you for your support um, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll be back with you next thursday goodbye team bye, bye. thank you very much take care